of the most recognizable brand names in the world, and one of the most evocative. Santa Claus, a Christmas tree, a Lionel electric train. Powerful images, almost irresistible nostalgia. Home, family, warmth, colorful lights, colorful trains. Lionel, mixing memory and joyfulness. How did it become such a national institution? It started with a tinkerer by the name of Joshua Lionel Cowan. Joshua, what in the world are you doing in the kitchen? Joshua, was that another one of your inventions? Indeed it was, and it might have been the first train Joshua Lionel Cowan ever made. When he was only seven, he carved a locomotive out of wood and inserted a tiny steam engine in it. An engine he'd built himself. The whole contraption blew up. Joshua Cowan's effect on the world would become nothing short of explosive. Born in 1877 in New York City, Joshua was a natural tinkerer. He tinkered with electricity which was then still a frightening force. In school, young Josh was an indifferent student. His mind was restless, inclined toward experimentation, not the discipline of the classroom. Although he did attend good schools, the Peter Cooper Institute, City College of New York, and a semester at Columbia University. But eventually he lost interest, dropped out, and took a job at the Acme Electric Lamp Company. He was 18 and doing what he loved assembling, experimenting, tinkering. Results came quickly. In 1899, just short of his 22nd birthday, Joshua Lionel Cowan filed for his first patent. He invented a device for igniting photographer's flash powder using dry cell batteries to heat a wire fuse. The Spanish-American War was ablaze. Josh's detonating device interested the U.S. Navy for setting off mines not flashbulbs. They ordered 24,000 detonators. In early 1900, Joshua Cowan went into business for himself. In a loft at 24 Murray Street in New York City, he opened the Lionel Manufacturing Company with the idea of making what he called electric novelties. When asked later why he'd call his company Lionel, he replied with his usual dry wit, I had to call it something. Joshua Cowan claimed, with some justification, to have invented, but then discarded as impractical, the flashlight, the dry cell battery, and the electric fan. He later admitted that the fan motor spun the blades around at a great rate, but all that furious spinning produced absolutely no breeze. Perhaps because of that figure, Joshua found a better use for the fan motor. He mounted it under a little wood box, put wheels on it, and ran it around in a circle of track. He thought it would be a terrific attention getter in a store window. The first stop for the little device was Ingersoll's toy and novelty shop, where the toys in the window stood motionless. The proprietor, Robert Ingersoll, hoped the electric vehicle would bring life to the window and sales to the store. I'd like to buy that train in the window. Which one? The one you pull on the string or the one you wind up? Neither. The one that goes around by itself? Oh, that's just our window display. Well, how much do you want for it? Ingersoll kept selling those window displays, and so did a lot of other stores. Josh Cowan realized he was onto something. Something different from his original idea, but something big. The Lionel Manufacturing Company and Christmas never be the same.
first Lionel electric train was the electric express gondola. The car, plus 30 feet of two rail track, sold for $6, a premium price for the time. The same car without a motor sold for $2.75. The track was wide, two and seven eighths inches between the rails, much wider than the typical two inch track of other toy trains. 1902 was the age of the trolley, so Lionel made a trolley, the City Hall Park. Lionel also offered its first accessory that year, a suspension bridge. In 1903, Lionel introduced the B&O No. 5, a reproduction of the engine that hauled trains through the Baltimore Railroad tunnels. There was also a crane to run with the engine. By 1905, sales had reached $8,000. In 1906, Lionel came out with a new track to replace the old two-rail type. There was a third rail in the middle, which carried the electric current. The new track was also three-fourths of an inch narrower. Business grew steadily, and the line expanded. The brass number no. seven steamer. More trolleys. Passenger cars. By 1909, Lionel adopted the slogan, Standard of the World. Josh's son, Larry, born in 1907, would be pictured on all Lionel boxes with this new slogan. Josh also began calling his three rail track, Standard Gauge clever promotional trick that tied it in with the new slogan. Of course, Lionel's track wasn't standard at all, but one that was different from all of the others. There was Correct, which probably created the first electric train in 1893. Carlisle and Finch, Voltamp Electric, American Flyer, Howard Lamp, which was the first company to feature an illuminated headlight, and Ives, who had been making clockwork or wind-up trains since the early 1870s. In 1910, Ives switched over to electrically powered trains. Too late to ever catch Lionel. After Ives started competing with Lionel, Josh Cowan, always aggressive in his catalog presentations, began a series of direct attacks on Ives' products. His catalogs compared Lionel's best products to Ives' cheapest. Josh never let the facts stand in the way of a good story or picture. And in the world of the Lionel catalog, the Lionel factory looked a lot better than its competitor, bigger and grander than the real thing. Joshua Cowan had a very personal approach to his catalogs. His messages were aimed directly at boys, telling of the advantages of playing with cranes and learning about electricity, besides letting them know the folly of buying competing products. In 1915, to respond to Ives' challenge, Lionel introduced their own line of O-Gage trains. O-Gage was a better size for the homes of the day, which was smaller than huge homes of the Victorian age. America was in the First World War, and Lionel began producing equipment for the Navy. Compasses, binnacles, navigational equipment. The war curtailed toy production, although an armored train with ammunition cars highlighted a very thin product line in 1917 and 18. With the armistice of 1918 came new successes for Lionel. Toy trains began to sell again even without the aid of a catalog. The decade of the 1920s, remembered historically as a time of prosperity, prohibition and high living, was booming for Lionel too. It was the classic era of standard gauge.
Handsome 400E steamer. The beautiful blue cot. The gigantic state set, almost nine feet long, seven inches high, and one of the most elaborate toy trains ever made. Trains to inspire awe on Christmas morning. And there were huge accessories to go with the trains. The Hellgate Bridge. The power station. The terrace station. The roundhouses. the scenic park. And to complement standard gauge were the great O-gauge trains. The orange 256 passenger set. The 260E steamer. Even trains you could build yourself. Sales edged over one million dollars for the first time in 1920. Then reached a high for the decade of 2.3 million in 1927. Mario Caruso, hired in 1910, had become the driving force in the factory. He would eventually become the very powerful secretary treasurer. And many other key people came aboard in the 20s. People who would ultimately lead the company to greatness. Joseph Bonanno, who would become head of engineering. Charles Giamo, the future plant manager. Arthur Raphael became the sales manager. A brilliant merchandiser, Raphael initiated aggressive and sophisticated sales techniques. Window and point of sale displays. Sales brochures. Newspaper and magazine ads for dealers. And advanced catalogs. Raphael also introduced the policy of department store specials making special trains for big accounts like Sears and Macy's. These train sets were similar to catalog sets, but made up in different colors and consists. So the smaller dealer would not be in direct competition with the large department stores. Lionel was becoming unstoppable. went into receivership. It had not been able to withstand the relentless battering from Josh Cowan's superior selling and manufacturing techniques. During the receivership transition, some Ives products were put out jointly by Lionel and its main competitor, American Flyer. Then, in October of 1929, the stock market crashed, setting off the Great Depression. Like the rest of the nation, Lionel suffered. It was a time of bread lines and soup kitchens and massive layoffs. The giant Lionel factory stood almost empty as the company battled in vain to find customers for its trains. In 1933, losses reached $200,000 and debts totaled $300,000. In May of 1934, 
Lionel went into receivership. However, Josh wasn't about to quit. He was able to stall the creditors and produce the 1934 line, perhaps his last, had it not been for the Mickey Mouse hand car. The hand car saved Lionel, sold for one dollar with eight sections of track. It accounted for more than $250,000 in sales and provided the all-important cash Lionel needed to survive. And that cash would fuel another explosive change for the company. The era of streamlining had arrived. For a long time, the nation's railroads, accustomed to decades of success, had grown complacent. They fought costly innovations like air conditioning and light high-speed trains. And suddenly found themselves losing their customers to airplanes and automobiles. Railroads got the message and began to modernize. So did Lionel. The first American streamlined train was the Union Pacific's M10,000. It was a permanently coupled, articulated train, put into service in late 1934. This train was a breakthrough because it marked the first time that Lionel worked from blueprints provided by the railroads. The Lionel M10,000 debuted in the stores at almost the same time that the real train appeared. The momentum grew. Sales soared. Lionel fought its way out of receivership and went into 1935 showing a profit. And three new streamliners. The Flying Yankee, which was the Boston and Maine's version of the Burlington Zephyr, Road's all-new streamliner for the Chicago Twin Cities run. And once again, Lionel beat its competitors with a detailed true-to-blueprint replica of the original. The cover of the 1935 catalog showed an ecstatic boy holding a model of the Hiawatha, while standing beside the real engineer, Hugh McManus, in front of the real engine. Although the real versions of the Hiawatha, the M10,000, and the Zephyrs were popular with the public, the railroads were still reluctant to allocate the great deal of money required for the all-new streamliners. So they compromised. They began dressing up their old equipment. They hired famous industrial designers to fashion cowlings on their steamers. Otto Kuhn worked for the Milwaukee Road. Harry Dreyfus consulted for the New York Central. And Raymond Lowy, who had designed the Coca-Cola bottle, also designed the GG1 for the Pennsylvania Railroad. The next several years were busy ones for Lionel. Following the trends in streamlining brought about by these designers, and introducing a new line of die-cast steamers. The Whistle. Accessories. And scale rolling stock. They also had to say goodbye to the last of the great standard gauge models. The average size of homes had steadily shrunk since the turn of the century. Those giant standard gauge trains had lost their appeal. Lionel discontinued the line in 1939. Despite the trend toward streamlining, Lionel defied the odds and introduced a scale model of the New York Central's Hudson, Lionel's famous 700 EW. It was the finest locomotive the company had ever made. It was graced with meticulous detailing.
marks on the tender was meant to equal those of the real tender. When a fastidious modeler actually counted the rivets on both tenders, he found a three rivet discrepancy. He informed the company. Josh, incredulous, insisted on a recount. It turned out that the modeler was right. The real tender had 1,402, Lionel's 1,399. A stubborn Josh Cowan refused to make even a tiny change to his masterpiece. With the Hudson, Lionel recognized a growing adult hobbyist market. The Hudson did not have the toy look of the earlier steamers. It combined scale model accuracy with mass production performance and economy. No toy train company had ever attempted the detail that Lionel achieved with the Hudson. In a way, the Hudson wasn't a toy. Although it was rugged enough to absorb youthful punishment, it cost $75. In 1937, that was enough to guarantee that fathers would not be buying it on impulse for their sons. For the same price in those days, you could buy a Calvinator refrigerator. A new Ford Coupe cost $568. As the 1930s dissolved into the 1940s, train production continued at an all-time high. started shutting down toy train production lines in favor of war work. The company supplied the Navy with alcohol-filled compasses, binnacles, parts for telescopic sights, even percussion primers for anti-aircraft shells. In 1943, the U.S. Maritime Commission gave Lionel the highest honor given to military suppliers, the M for Merit Award for Outstanding Wartime Production. With no steel available during the war years, Lionel made what they called a fiberboard train, which has become famous as the paper train. This was the idea of Samuel Gold, who made prizes for candy manufacturers. He proposed to Josh Cowan that boys ought to have some kind of train to play with during the war. The train was made of cardboard and came, or so the box said, ready to assemble. That is, if your father could figure out how to assemble 250 different train parts, with hundreds of slots and tabs into something that resembled a toy train. World War II ended in September of 1945, and Lionel had trains in time for Christmas. There'd been no time to conjure up any innovations except the long-awaited, realistic-looking knuckle coupler, which had actually been developed before the war, but whose debut had to wait until VJ Day. In 1946, Lionel introduced the 20-wheel model of the Pennsylvania steam turbine, with smoke that came from dropping little white pellets into the smokestack, and a water tower that you could watch as the water level magically went down. A paper shortage prevented the printing of the 1946 catalog in normal quantities. So Lionel took out a 16-page ad for its new line in Liberty Magazine. At the time, it was the largest magazine ad ever printed. The post-World War II era was the most profitable in Lionel's history and solidified Lionel's place as a full partner in the triumvirate of Christmas. Santa Claus, the evergreen tree, and a Lionel electric train. Joshua Lionel Cowan, a natural showman, believed that animation and activity on layouts were an absolute must. He once said, children want movement and action. They don't want to just watch a train go round and round. A few minutes of that and the little nippers will wander off and squeeze out some toothpaste or set fire to the curtains. During the post-war years, 
Josh Cowan gave the Little Nippers plenty of action, especially in accessories. <laughs> best-selling engine it had ever made, the Santa Fe F3, an engine that was destined to become a classic, and the one most people picture when someone mentions the name Lionel. The F3 was the idea of Larry Cup, who had become president of Lionel in 1945. His father became chairman of the board. The prototype of the F3 was made by General Motors. It was Lionel's first diesel. It also came in the colors of the New York Central. Larry convinced Santa Fe, the New York Central, and General Motors to share in the expense of the dies, which cost about $25,000. Each gambled $6,000, and each thought it was a good deal. It was. Lionel's New York Central ran for eight years. The Santa Fe for 18 years. 1948 was also the year the Pennsylvania GG1 was introduced. ZW Transformer that could run four trains at one time. Like all Lionel Transformers, the new ZW produced the unforgettable smell of ozone, one of the many cherished memories of every kid who ever played with a Lionel train. With these revolutionary new products, the great post-war era of Lionel had begun. A succession of beautiful toy trains followed. Well detailed, functional, sturdy, and all captured on the pages of the Lionel catalogs by artists who used angles, settings, and proportions that made the trains both lifelike and irresistible. To a boy growing up in the 50s, the Lionel catalog was a treasure to be savored and saved. The drawings were pleasantly deceptive. The trains drawn in perspectives that made them look larger or more detailed than they really were but no one was disappointed. Somehow, reality lived up to fancy. designated the 50th anniversary year by Lionel, was particularly memorable. Joshua Cowan brought back the Hudson, another exceptional piece of work. An Alco diesel was introduced. NW1 type yard switchers, B units, the coal ramp, the bubbling oil derrick, and magnet traction, an innovation bringing new pulling power to locomotives. The Lionel engineers magnetized the driving wheels to grip the rails better. Not only could the engines pull more, but they had better traction on hills and could stay on the rails at higher speeds. Sales continued to climb reaching a peak of almost $33 million in 1953, about $150 million in today's dollars. But the times were changing, and a troubled storm hovered over Lionel's horizon. In the heady rush of success, 
no one cared to take a hard look at the future. America had become airborne. It was more thrilling to soar over America in an airplane than to roar through America on a passenger train. Cars and space captured the country's fancy. Slot cars were popular, and rocket toys, robots, and TV. The new popular size of toy trains was HO gauge, but Lionel had not downsized to HO. Finally, under increasing competitive pressure, they responded with an HO line in 1957. But like Ives almost 50 years earlier, Lionel had seen the light too late. Lionel had forgotten its toy trains. Attempts at diversification, fishing reels, a 3D camera, had proved unsuccessful. In 1958, only five years after its sales peak, Lionel lost $469,000, the first loss since the Depression. A frustrated Joshua Lionel Cowan, age 80, retired. Larry was still the president, but that lasted for only a year. In 1959, the Cowan family sold their stock to a group headed by Roy Cohen, an ambitious New York attorney who became nationally prominent during the McCarthy hearings. the 1960s without the Cowans. Instead, a series of management teams frantically searched for financial rescue, but could not overcome the downward spiral of sales. A wide variety of new products was introduced. Lionel tried branching out into slot car racing, chemistry sets, and some things that defied description, but still nothing caught on. Hey, hey, Helios 21 is here. Giant spaceship of the 21st century. Wow! You control Helios 21 by wire from the space controller. One filling keeps it up for weeks. Wow! Can I do it? Wow! Send it to the moon, to Mars, send it to my house. Oh, and do you know who made it for you? My house! Wow! Famous for trains and auto racing. In 1965, at age 88, Joshua Lionel Cowan died in Florida. Larry died of a heart attack five years later at the age of 63. In 1967, two years after Joshua Lionel Cowan's death, Lionel bought American Flyer, its once proud competitor, for $150,000 from the A.C. Gilbert Company, whose train fortunes were falling faster than Lionel's. No effort was made to produce any flyer sets. Lionel was sinking fast and could no longer scatter its resources. No one, it seemed, wanted to buy an electric train. General Mills, the breakfast cereal conglomerate, was expanding into toys. They approached Lionel. Lionel gave up its electric trains. Lionel plant was moved from New Jersey to Mount Clemens, Michigan. Lionel trains were produced under a subsidiary named Model Products Corporation, or MPC. Then in 1972, MPC was renamed Fundimensions, an umbrella under which the three hobby and craft lines, Lionel, Craftmaster Paint by Number Sets, and MPC Plastic Model Kits would be produced. Fundimension's marketing strategy was to focus its attention on both the collector and the child, reproducing many of the great Lionel trains from the 50s and introducing beautiful new trains, 
graphically more detailed and bolder than any Lionel had ever made before. If anybody loves trains, it's me, Johnny Cash. You know, if your boy's under 10 like mine is, he needs a big Lionel like this Black River Freight. This Christmas, get your boy a train that's built for the way young boys play. A big, rugged Lionel. Lionel, the big train for small hands. The new trains helped attract a new wave of hobbyists who operate, collect, buy, sell, and trade new and vintage Lionel trains at swap meets across the country. General Mills enjoyed a renewed success with Lionel throughout the 70s. By 1981, Lionel posted over $21 million in sales, its best year since it had peaked in the 50s. But another upheaval loomed just ahead. General Mills, fighting rising costs in all of its toy divisions, moved the production of Lionel and other product lines to Mexico. The new factory, hampered by an inexperienced labor force and supply problems, was unable to meet demand, and sales fell once again. In 1985, Fund Dimensions management convinced General Mills to return the Lionel line to Michigan. They quickly assembled a labor force made up of their most experienced workers, some of whom had been idle since 1983, and dug into the task of making cranes once more. On November 1, 1985, General Mills spun off its toy group, Kenner Products and Parker Brothers, as a new freestanding corporation called Kenner Parker Toys Incorporated. Lionel was also spun off as a division of the new corporation. The other product lines of the now defunct Fund Dimensions, MPC, Craftmaster, and Make It and Bake It, were sold. Lionel was now primed for acquisition. In April 1986, Richard Kuhn, a many-faceted businessman who became a multi-millionaire in the shopping mall development business, bought control of the train line and its manufacturing equipment. Kuhn is also a collector of trains and cars, with a reverence for Lionel's past and a vision toward the future. Well, I got interested in, in the concept or the thought of buying Lionel trains because it was romantic. The Lionel name goes back to 1900. It's been a tradition for generations, uh, you know, for what, 90 years almost. And that is a tradition that should be carried on, and, I, and I'm firmly, I firmly believe it will be carried on for many generations to come. I think there's a, a real fundamental reason the trains have survived. Number one, it's a tremendous learning experience. You can build models, uh, scenery, you, you deal with mechanical things, you deal with electrical things, you can design uh, uh, from a little child on up to a great-grandfather. A great it's something you can do you can accomplish, you can build. I think we have a great company. I think we turn out a great product. And as long as we continue doing that, people are gonna want our product. Kuhn and the Lionel yeah, management yeah, team yeah, yeah, yeah. work very closely together on product development, strategic planning, and other issues. Most of the management group has been with the company for 10 years or more. Some even mark their tenure, not in years, but in decades. Together with hundreds of involved and loyal employees, they have expanded the Lionel line every year, bringing back great trains from the past and adding exquisite new ones. Lionel's president, Art Peisner. Our current product lines are O-Gage, O-27 Gage, and S-Gage product lines. Those that we've been in for so many years, our American Flyer and Lionel product lines, will continue to benefit from increased investments in new tooling, brand new products. Of course, as we've always done, fresh new designs, new road names, new markings. Just a couple of years ago, we started in our large-scale product line and that now has become an important part of the growth of Lionel. We'll continue to expand and build on that product line in the future. Our classics, the resurrection of, of Lionel standard gauge products, is another direction for growth for us, and that too has grown very substantially in a very short period of time. 
Of course, there's a great deal that goes into making a train. A tremendous amount of hand labor, great attention to detail, the quality control steps along the way, every step of the way, all of that's expensive. All of those things are costly. And that's part of why our products have to be expensive. But you know, Lionel was always an expensive product. Lionel was never the low-cost product in the train business. It's not today, and it won't be in the future. But you get value when you buy a Lionel train. Yeah, I do think I'm the luckiest guy in the world when I look at all these toy trains around me, no question about it. What happened, how do I feel when I walk in the room? I think my heart skips a few beats and I, I just stand there. I, it's awesome to me, to these toy trains. I, I love them. And so it goes, this child of the 20th century, this adult of the 20th century, Lionel. It might be appropriate that it was created by a boy who was allowed to tinker in his home. Home, where so much of what he invented would be enjoyed. Lionel has represented the trends of the 20th century, changing yet remaining constant. It has endured, its values as lasting as those passed from parent to child. New Lionel... Hang on a second, folks. As tradition with the Lion Election DVDs, I want to show the end credits, which is a bit different than the videotape. Yeah, hold on. <laughs> Get past the previews. Hope you enjoyed the series. Up next will probably be I Love Big Trains and then Hello Wheels. Five. <laughs> well, we passed the credits. Hold on. Hard to believe I would end this four part series with a blooper or two. <laughs> Y'all know me. These videos ain't ever really well rehearsed. Any after this, it'll be Isla Big Trains, and then Hell on Wheels in the American West. And before anybody asks, no, I don't have any other TM programs at the moment. What you see is what I've got, but I'll get some more eventually. Uh, maybe through my Patreon account, I can purchase more with the money that you guys um, um, sent to me for my memberships I'm setting up. We'll see. Who knows? It's in God's hands, whatever's next. Or visit. Now available. Nope. <laughs> Not quite. Like I said, this ain't rehearsed or staged. This is all happening right here, right now. And I'm just as embarrassed as you are. <laughs> oh, mercy. This is the last one I think we have to get through. I apologize. But hey, there you go. A little bit of free advertising. Hi, I'm Johnny Cash. You know, kids get something wonderful when they get a Lionel train. They get that. Chugging round the tree on Christmas Day, can't you hear that Lionel train? Can't wait till my boy gets to run that line. I'll never tell him that it's really mine. Lionel, Lionel, now it has the mighty sound of steam. My dad and I ran the Lionel Road quite a few Christmases back. And I can still hear the clickety clack as our Lionel rounded the trickety track. Yes, I had a Lionel when I was a boy. Now my boy's gonna have one for his own toy. Lionel, Lionel, the greatest little railroad in the world. Lionel, Lionel, now it has a mighty sound of steam. Chugging round the tree on Christmas Day, can't you hear that Lionel train?
watching.